One night in a row. Okay, praise the Lord, everybody. Luckily, y'all got here early, so you... not mad at England anymore because we got our way, praise the Lord. But anyway, great country that we live in, and with its flaws and faults, it's still the greatest place on earth to live, amen. And we still have a lot of our freedoms, even though it seems like uh, the enemy's trying to take them little by little, but uh, that's why we have to stand in faith and just declare the truth in spite of what the particular parts of government and other uh, institutions would like to take away from us, but uh, it's not going to happen. And amen. This country was founded on the Bible, on the Word of God. In fact, all of our laws are established because of that and through that, uh, even though the judges and often uh, lawyers even don't recognize it, but it's still the truth anyhow. Praise the Lord. So anyway, God bless all of you for being here. Appreciate it. And uh, I, have we got any announcements this morning, Mike? And because it is the 4th of July weekend, so to speak, because it's the holiday uh, coming up Tuesday, uh, obviously that's a reason for a lot of people being out of town and camping and doing all those things, which is great. They get to be with their family and enjoy that, and that's, that's not a bad thing either. So we just wish them well and hope that uh, they'll have a – Good weather for the entire stay, and and that they'll enjoy the Fourth of July too. So happy Fourth of July to everybody! Praise the Lord! Now the fourteenth, which is a week from this coming Friday, is that right? Yep. Will be uh, the Eastern Gate House of Prayer, and as always, uh, we appreciate anybody and everybody that comes, and you can come for ten minutes, or you can come for the full two or however long hours it takes to find the the presence of God and what God's wanting to do in that particular service. So everyone is always uh, welcome to come and participate in that as prayer, praying for this nation, praying for Israel, praying for a move of God. And uh, so it's always a good thing. And it does have an impact. I can tell you, preaching the following Sunday, I can tell the difference. It does affect the principalities and powers that, that try to dominate, amen, certain areas of the, of, of the country and around the world. So it's a very good thing, a positive thing. So come and be part of it. Amen. Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. Uh, Roberto is going to be teaching uh, some classes on uh, financial uh, responsibility. And I'll, if you want to, I'll just let you say a little something about it right now. the Lord. <laughs> That's God. <laughs> Hallelujah.
Amen. I think it'll be a good thing. Everybody knows finances are one of the biggest issues in everybody's life, married or unmarried. And uh, so it's, it's a positive thing. Uh, we need discipline when it comes to that. Sometimes I'm a little more, um, I like to say spontaneous. Sally says foolish, but uh, <laughs> when it comes to money. But, but you know, we really do need to, to have discipline and, and, uh, and learn some valuable lessons about how, how we handle our finances. And, and God's really interested in that. He wants to bless us, and he wants us to be good stewards of what he does bless us with, so that's an important thing. And not only that, this is not just going to be for the, our local church, but they'll have it on their website, so anybody in this area that's wanting to take the class will be coming here too. So it'll give us an opportunity to minister to other people and as well as uh, give them some good financial foundational uh, in, uh, in, information, praise the Lord, and revelation, I think, in, in a lot of cases. So, so we're looking forward to that, and I appreciate Roberto uh, taking this on and and having the burden to, to share it with others. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Any prayer requests this morning? Yeah. I'm asking people. Just a minute, Denise. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Mike, could one of you guys turn the air down to 72 or 70 or somewhere? I can feel it's getting a little warm up here already. Appreciate it. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you, James. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Just put your attention on him and things begin to change. Thank Amen. the Lord. Okay, we'll remember that young man and we'll be praying with you about it. Anybody else? Praise the Lord. We Yeah, we want to pray for Dan uh, Glade, Tammy's husband. He has had another attack of the devil against his kidneys, and he's back in the hospital, and uh, we don't have a whole lot of information at this point because he just went in last night or yesterday evening late. But uh, God is able. He yeah. raised him up the last time, and, and he was doing great, but there's some ongoing issues here that uh, needs to be dealt with, and we're just going to believe that God's going to give him total and complete healing and restoration for that entire condition. Amen. We know that he can. I mean, we've got people right sitting here right now that had bigger, more uh, dangerous, if you will, from a medical perspective than even what he's facing, although what he's facing is serious. But to God, it's all the same. A common cold, allergies, cancer, uh, kidney failure, it's all the same to God. By his stripes, we were healed. Amen. And that's where we have to put our attention and our focus. And I, as I mentioned last week, and I'm going to talk about, it, uh, talk about it again this week, we are priests, a nation of kings and priests. Look at the Old Testament. I'm going to get way ahead of myself, but it's, it, it's pertinent to what we're talking about here right now. Jesus sent people, when he healed the lepers and others, he sent them to the priests, to the temple, and the priests declared them healed. We are the temple of God, and we are the priests in this temple. Jesus is the high priest. But we are the ones that declare who's healed, if they're healed, when they're healed. I mean, that's what that's our job for ourselves and for others as well. So we need to not be begging God and pleading with God to do something that he's already done. What we need to be doing is confessing what, that, what he has done. They went to, the scripture says Jesus sent them to the priests, and on their way, they were healed. Praise the Lord. So we're, we're declaring healing, amen, for this young man that James is talking about, as well as Dan. And anybody else that, that is struggling with these things, amen? 
They're attacks of the enemy. God does not give us sickness or disease. That comes from the devil. From the, it's all part of the fall. Amen. So uh, it's our responsibility and our privilege to declare healing wherever it is needed. Amen. So that's, that's what we're going to do this morning. Amen. And yes, Jane. Praise God. God is everywhere, but we know that uh, he isn't honored everywhere necessarily. So unless, sadly, our universities are, are one of those places where that usually isn't happening on a, on a large scale. But there are good Christians. If your granddaughter's going there, she's a Christian. So we know that there'll be other Christians there, too. And we just, we'll just pray, amen, for God's protection and provision, and also that she can make friends with people of like faith, people that will help to be that influence. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Yeah. They're, uh, they're struggling with an insurance company that, you know, drags their feet on every, in every, uh, every way that they can. And uh, I, I just tell her, you know, of course, you know, we all have had to deal with insurance companies somewhere along the line. And we know that the last thing they, the last thing they want to do is pay. Amen. They just, they're there for the premium every month or six months or whatever, however you're paying it, but they could care less about taking care of your issues. So we got to remember one thing. First of all, God's the source and not the insurance company. But then again, if the insurance company is not going to operate the way it's supposed to, then we need to pray that the insurance commissioner, somebody else gets involved in this where they are pressured to do what they're supposed to be doing in the first place. But we want to agree together with Dan and Tammy that that, that whole insurance issue is going to be resolved and they'll get the money that they have coming and, and God will take care of all of it. Amen? Amen? Okay. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Prayer requests? Uh, we're good. Okay. All right. Let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer right now for all of these needs. And again, let me just let, if some of you guys want to come and lay hands on James here, we'll pray the prayer of faith. But in the meantime, every all of these other issues that we're dealing with, let's, let's just declare the victory. Amen. That's, our, that's what we do. Amen. We, we say they're healed. Praise the Lord. They're delivered. They're prospered. They're whatever. That's our job. Amen. That's our responsibility as believers. So in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you right now for James. We ask you, Lord, to uh, manifest your love to him, the love that you have for him that we know is so great that he'll experience no more anxiety, uh, no more stress, that he'll begin to really see the love of God in his life and trust in that. Lord, we just pray for deliverance in every area of his life in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. And Lord, on behalf of all of these other needs, you knew them before we got here. You laid them on people's hearts to pray. And so we agree together with you right now, Lord, that by your stripes they're healed. Amen. You suffered loss so that we could have prosperity, so that we could have blessing. And, Lord, we know that you never leave us or forsake us, so we pray that you're with all of our young people. And the, the influence that we've been able to have in their lives will come to the forefront as they leave their homes and they go out into the world. Lord, that as they were taught, so shall they live. Amen. Uh, we know the scripture says that raise a child up in the way that it should go, and they will not depart from it, Lord. And we trust that you will keep them in that place of favor and love, blessing and salvation in Jesus' name. Keep your hand upon them, Lord. Keep them from evil. And show yourself mighty on all of our behalves, and we'll be sure to give you and you alone all the praise, all the glory, all the thanksgiving 
that you alone deserve. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. John, would you uh, do me uh, the favor of taking up the offering this morning? And if you would, pray over the offering. Amen. God bless you as you give, and the worship team can come.
Jesus. And Isaiah 6 says that uh, the angels cried one to another, having seen the presence of the Lord in the temple. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Prior to that, it tells us, and we sang it this song, a very prophetic song taken from Isaiah prophet, that said the temple was filled with his glory. We talked about it last week, and we'll talk about it a little bit more this week, but that temple is still being built. Yes. We are the temple of God. Corporately, we become the temple of God, and his glory fills the temple, and that's how his glory fills the entire earth, amen, is through the temple. Praise the Lord. Nothing changes, really. That was just a physical, material thing, and he was speaking of something far more spiritual, a reality that God has for each and every one of us, and that's what we need to see. That's what we need to understand. His glory is in you, and it's in you so that it can fill the entire earth, amen, so that the whole earth can see what we just sang about. So they can experience the glory of God, the holiness of God, the goodness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the power of God. Amen? That is the reality. It's not a building somewhere in Israel. Although we give deference to the, to the Israelis and to the Jews because it's through them that all of this comes to us. But God is talking about something far greater than a physical structure someplace in the Middle East. He's talking about the temple that he always wanted, that he designed himself, which is us, filled with the glory of God. Hallelujah. And that way, the temple can minister anywhere and everywhere all the time. Praise God. Wherever a need is, people can come to the glory of God and to the presence of the Lord. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Mike and men. Praise the Lord. And a generous, specific worship team this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> there you go. Oh, stay thirsty. Need some of you. Thirsty, Lord, I'm talking about. Praise God. All right. Uh, God bless you. Young people may be dismissed to go downstairs. Praise the Lord. So I, at uh, the risk of being a little bit repetitious, I'm not really preaching last week's message by any means, but I, I, I'm going to touch on a few of those things just because some of you that may not have been here, it'll kind of maybe bring it into a little clearer context. But Praise the Lord. Thanks again for everybody that is here and uh, our prayers and blessings go out to those that are with family and that are camping and traveling and and doing all those other things as well. And uh, we just pray that God will minister to each of us through his word this morning. Praise the Lord. So, Sheila, if you are up and ready, I'd like to begin at Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to read, I'm going to read a lengthy portion of scripture here. And uh, just because I, the only way we can really understand what it is I'm talking about is to kind of get the big picture here. So, uh, there may be a couple of times here that I'll have to read longer portions of scriptures than we usually do, but thank you. Uh, so much of the time, it just gets to be where we, we've read them so many times and heard them read that they kind of just float right past us. It isn't that we don't understand what, God is, uh, what God's word is about. It's just that you can get so used to something, you know, that... I don't want to say contempt. You know the old cliche is that familiarity breeds contempt. I don't mean contempt. I just mean maybe just a lack of focus sometimes because we've seen it and heard it and read it so many times that we just take it for granted and move on to the next thing. But So if you will, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 and beginning at verse 1, and we'll read right through to verse 23. Praise God. I hear voices. Here we go. For the law having 
a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will. To do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither haddest pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. That's T, okay? Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And you read the, the language there, Jesus is the high priest, right? He was the offering as well. But it tells us we now can go into the Holy of Holies, meaning that we are the priest entering into the presence of God. That's All that stuff was symbolic, okay? And we major on the symbolism and forget the reality, which is the spirit that God's trying to get us to understand who we are, what our identity is, and what we are supposed to be doing in this world. And it's not religious. It's strictly spiritual. Amen? Having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. All right, Sheila, if you will, go back to verse 17, and I want to read verses 7, 7 I'm sorry, back to verse 7, verse 7 through 14. <clears throat> Just to focus on this one portion here. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither haddest pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will. He, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Praise the Lord. Perfected forever them that are sanctified. That would be us. Praise the Lord. We've been set aside. Now, what does it talk about the priests under the old covenant? They were set aside. They were sanctified for one purpose, to be priests. The Aaronic ministry, that's where it was supposed to all go back to. You had to trace your roots back to Aaron in order to be a priest. Amen. So that's, you know, we're, we're, we're going back beyond Aaron to God himself. Praise the Lord. Okay, so look, here's, here's where we're at. Have you ever tried to watch a 3D movie without the glasses? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You only, all you see is blurry images. 
So you, you might understand the, uh, the basic story, but you miss all the nuances, all of the, uh, the finer points that are being played out. Amen? Because those glasses help you see more clearly and more fully the picture, the, the whole idea behind the movie. Amen? So last Sunday we were talking about uh, God's presence, how it fills the earth as the temple. That's how his presence fills the earth. He does it as the temple of God. So why haven't we seen it before? Maybe some of you have, but I'm asking myself, why haven't I seen it before? It's like the 3D glasses. Revelation, in the context of the Bible, provides lenses. It gives us the way to help us see the interconnectedness of Scripture, how it literally fits together. You could call it revelation. I'm just using this as a metaphor this morning, the 3D images, and how without the glasses, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't, everything just doesn't fit together the way it should. It, you may have a basic understanding, but miss all of the, the real scope and power of the story itself. So, to see beyond religion and beyond denominationalism, we need to see this interconnectedness of Scripture. We need to have the eyes of God. We need to see by the Spirit, amen, and not through the eyes of the flesh. Now, when we read about the Old Testament writers, the prophets, they didn't have a comprehensive understanding of how the prophecies were going to be fulfilled. They had a revelation. They had a uh, information and prophetic uh, knowledge or words, but it wasn't a full picture. They didn't understand what it was going to mean a thousand years later. They just only understood it in the context of where they were at that particular moment. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Praise the Lord. So those prophesied events actually were in a new world in a world that was yet to come in the natural. It existed, but it just wasn't here. And we know Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it wasn't like it was waiting, we were waiting for something to happen. We were just waiting for it to happen in the natural realm. And that's why prophecy is able to be accomplished. God is just telling them the end from the beginning. But they don't understand it because they're still fixed in time, which is what happens to us a lot of times. God will give us a word, and it just doesn't make sense in the context, and then a few years down the road, you go, whoa, wait a minute. That's what he was talking about. So it's like a picture that we see from, from space. See, Jesus is going to inaugurate this world that they're prophesying about, but they don't understand the fullness of that prophetic word. And so it's, it's just like, you know, you see these pictures from satellites or from, you know, space probes and stuff, you know, pointed back to the earth. And you see the earth from this distance, and it just seems like a globe, like a ball floating around out there in the middle of nothing, with these different shades of color and, uh, and uh, light, and, and they kind of represent clouds and oceans and land masses. And that's all you can really see from that distance, right? It just looks like something you saw in 12th grade geography or something, or 6th or grade geography where you're dealing with the globe and all. But the closer you get, the closer to earth, mountains begin to appear, rivers, forests. All these things start to become more visible. And then as you draw even closer, you see cities and buildings and houses and eventually people come into focus. And the close-up picture reveals details that someone only with this distant view could ever have guessed was the reality. Are you with me? I mean, you just see, just like even in an airplane, you fly and, and as you begin, you don't see anything. There's, maybe you see some clouds beneath you. But the closer you get to the earth, the more details begin to come about. Until you're so close, you can actually see people walking around and doing all the stuff that people do. But from that distance, if that was your only perspective, You'd never guess the reality of what was taking place on that planet. It just looks like, well, there's some different 
areas there, but, but that's it. Just water and clouds and so forth. And the closer you get, the more details come about, the more you see, the more you understand. And ha if you only had the perspective of distance, you'd never be able to imagine the reality or the truth of what's happening on that planet. Amen? So the close-up, in fact, it even looks like a different reality from the distance. When you see the picture from the satellite and then you look at somebody who's just taken a, got a sky cam or something that's 100 feet above the ground, you, they look like two different realities altogether. They don't even look like the same thing. Praise the Lord. But both, both of them, now understand this, both of them are literal depictions of what is there. They're both seeing the exact same thing. They're just seeing it from different distances. Amen? So they're both actually seeing the same thing. And so the literal picture of the Old Testament prophecy is magnified by New Testament revelation, which is where the church has failed in a lot of ways. We've wanted to focus on the Old Testament thing, the symbolism, or the picture that we saw from far off, instead of coming into the revelation that God wants us to have so we can really understand what that was about. Yeah. Amen. So revelation enlarges the details of uh, fulfillment in the beginning of this new world, this new creation. Okay? Still with me? Revelation, all it really does is enlarge or make clearer the fulfillment of the beginning of this new creation, this new world. Amen? Amen. The consequences is, or the consequence, I should say, is Christ not only begins to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies, but Christ is revealing the meaning for the prophecies' existence all along. So he isn't just fulfilling prophecies. <coughs> He's showing you the reason for the prophecies. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so that's one thing. Then there's, then there's typology. Typology relates to the past. It, it takes the past and relates it to the present in terms of uh, historical correspondence and ex escalation. So you have typology, takes the past, connects it to the present in a way that gives historical, how it can correspond historically to today. And then it escalates it, makes it even bigger. That's, that's typology. We're always talking about types and shadows. That's what the Old Testament is talking about. That's what we've read here today, amen, in Hebrews. That's what, that's what he was really talking about. So, uh, all that really means is that what God ordered in prefigurement, for example, Christ being slain before the foundation of the world, right? So, what God ordered in prefigurement finds a complement in the subsequent and greater event. I'm not purposely trying to be obtuse here, but I'm just saying that there's a reason for this that... that he, God prefigures everything because he knows the end from the beginning. So it's all done as far as God is concerned. It's already prefigured in the mind of God. And that prefigurement finds a complement or a resonance, if you will, in the subsequent, in the thereafter then, event that is actually greater than the prefigurement when it's understood. Because when we think, when you just look at, well, Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. Well, great, but what good is that? There is a greater reality of that that's going to impact my life and anybody else who believes in Jesus. It was a prefigured event before time, outside of time. But somehow time caught it, and I was there, and I get the benefit. And it's far more, amen, than just something that was prefigured in God. Now all of a sudden it's life-changing. In fact, it's world-changing. And that's what I mean by a, a subsequent greater event. Not in the mind of God, but in our way of understanding and comprehending it. Okay, so, for example, Jesus fulfills all this stuff. And he's the reason for 
the prophetic words to begin with. And he's the, he's the fulfillment of it, but he's also the reason why they all exist in the first place. And let me show you something. He's involved in everything, right? He is the prefigurement. He is all of it, right? For, for example, he, doesn't just, he isn't just the lamb slain from the foundation. He is events. He's not just a person that did something. He is actual events yes, Lord. that were prophesied. All right, look, at here's an example. The flood is a type of baptism. So here's an event, but that's talking about Jesus. It's, it's, not, it's not somebody you can just point to and say, oh, okay, that's a type of Jesus. No, this is a thing that happened. This is, this is an event. Look at, at 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 20 through 22. 1 Peter 3, 20 through 22. So just to, so that we see that he is all in all. Yes. Has always been, will always be. And we've diminished this to, well, he prophesied about the floods coming. No, it's about Jesus. The flood was an event, but it was about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. We look at it as a historic event. We look at it as this typical event took place. No, it's about Jesus. Everything in here is about Jesus. You need to understand that because when we get to where I'm talking about this morning, about us being the temple, about us being priests, about us being these things, you've got to understand all of this stuff that was going on was not about a priesthood. It was about a greater, an escalated event that was going to take place that Jesus actually is existing today in us. A temple exists. Priests still exist. But it's the fulfillment. It's the greater picture, the more perfect truth that God was trying to show from the prefigurement, yes. from the very beginning. Amen? So which sometime were disobedient when one, one the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The light figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven, it is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. So here's an event that was really just Jesus. One faith, right? Praise the Lord. One baptism. We say, well, come on, wait a minute. There's all kinds of baptism. There's baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's water baptism. There's this, there's that. All of it is about being baptized into Christ. So there's really only one baptism. It's all relating to being baptized into the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. Being reconnected with God. Amen? I'm not diminishing water baptism and other things. I'm just saying, ultimately, they all are about the same thing. Us and Christ becoming one. It isn't just about washing away your sins. If your sins weren't washed away before you got in that water, you're as dirty coming out as you were going in. Amen? You either just believe or you didn't. So... That, that's the point. Okay, so here, there's, there's the, the event. Now, just for another example, a person in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Adam is the type, but it's just Jesus. He's just talking about Jesus. It isn't, Adam isn't, Adam's really only important so that we can understand Christ. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. I mean, he's the cause of all this. No, Satan is the cause of it. Adam just gave in. Jesus didn't. Right. That's the type. It's still about Jesus. This thing going on in the garden was about Christ. It was still about a priesthood. It was still about a temple. Amen. And whether or not the, 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 those that were in the temple of God, that was God's original dwelling place, his first dwelling place where God resided with man and interacted with man, and man dropped the ball. They didn't believe God. Yeah. Praise the Lord. They didn't believe the word of God. Jesus only said what his father said. He believed perfectly because he and the father were one. He had the mind of God. All the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. Praise the Lord. So wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Adam is just pointing us to Jesus. 
just like the flood. Think of the, the catastrophic event, but it's just talking about Jesus. Yes. Yes. And when we miss that, we miss everything that God's trying to explain, everything that God's trying to show us about ourselves, about our relationship with him. Yes. Hallelujah. Okay. We well, talked about events, people, and I could, you could use anybody there's, there, over and over. David, all of these things are types of Christ. Yes. All right. How about institutions? All right. The sacrificial system is simply a type of Jesus. We just read it again in Romans chapter 10. Those things could never take away sin. They couldn't do anything about sin. It was something that God was looking to Christ and by looking to Christ, he held back judgment for those who were using the type. But it wasn't about the type. It wasn't about Judaism. It wasn't about religion. It was about Jesus. Yes. That's what he's talking about there in Romans 10. For example, Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll just look at, we're going to read 1 through 18. We just read on this, but I, I want you to see now what we're talking about. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers of their unto perfect. They're just a type. For then, if they could, then they, wouldn't have, they would have ceased to continue doing it. Amen? Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more consciousness of sin. They shouldn't even thought about sin or think that, well, i got to i got to have a sacrifice for this because I just did something. No. If the law had been fulfilled, there isn't any sin anymore. No need for a sacrifice. No need for the ritual. Right? But in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. Why? Because it's not the real thing. It's just pointing us to the real thing. It's just an institution. Somebody said the church is not an institution. It's a body. It's a temple. Yes. Yes. We've, made, we've tried to make it an institution, right. but it's not. Right. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering, now wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. David said the same thing. He said, You wanted mercy, not sacrifice. Right. Which is what he's talking about in Isaiah, and I mentioned it briefly last week. We're talking about the temple, and he says, I need somebody to stand in the gap. What do you mean by that? Between what the law demands and what God really wants. Right. That was what David did. Right. That's what that song we just sung about. He said, here am I, I'll go. There you go. Because you've got to fight the religious system in order to do that. Right. Amen. God wants mercy. Not religion. He wants grace. He wants love. He wants us to experience the relationship and not the denomination or the, the religious ritual. We've made it the other way around. We've just flipped everything and, and gone the opposite direction. So sacrifice offering, now what is not body prepared for me? In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. God didn't get any sense of, man, I'm glad they're doing this. This really blesses me. No, he didn't get any pleasure from it at all. It was an obligation. It was something that was pointing to what would give God pleasure. It pleased him to punish Christ. Why? Because the only way we were ever going to get what it was he wanted us to have initially. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it's written of me. He's saying what I'm saying. He comes and he said, this is what all of this is about. Yes, Lord. And because they didn't know it or didn't accept it, they didn't see it. They didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize what God was trying to do. They wanted to hang on to that tradition at the risk of losing their own souls and alienating themselves from God. So above, when he said, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst thou pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Praise the Lord. Continue. <coughs> then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So the, it isn't that there wasn't a purpose in the first. It's just that it was just to point us to the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. 
And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So it's just a redundancy of just doing it over and over and over and over because it was the ritual. It was what they were supposed to do, but it didn't change anything. It was pointing us to the one thing that could change everything. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my laws in their hearts and their minds, and, I'll, and in their minds I will write them. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering of sin. So Jesus is the institution. Or he is what the institution came from. Yes. His reality creates that. Amen? Amen? And we make it about the institution. So I'm saying Christ not only fulfills the prophecies, but also... The people, the institutions, and the events. Look at the Old Testament. He is everything. Yes. The volume of the book is written on him. Yes. And so this fulfillment comes sometimes in really weird ways, in surprising ways. For example, look at Hebrews chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. And it's surprising because... We're looking for something other than what we should be looking for. But it says here, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that you make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in heaven. We're thinking it's all about what he did down here. There was something, a reality that God was showing him in heaven that he was to build according to. Amen. That was Christ. That was the Lord. Amen. That was God's spiritual reality. Amen. Amen. So, again, last week we talked about God's unique presence in this material Old Testament temple. And how that was really to focus us on the new covenant age, God-man. God and man are one. Right. Praise the Lord. Christ, the true temple. Amen? Amen. Anybody that's ever gone through that whole tabernacle plan stuff, you know, and seen it, it all is showing us. It's just all Jesus. Right. Amen? Amen? Now, as a result of Christ's resurrection... The Spirit, the Holy Spirit that was sent back, he continues building the end time temple. Right. Praise the Lord. We're looking for a building somewhere, and God, God, the construction is still ongoing. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. He's got a temple that's going to fill the earth so that his glory can fill the earth. Yep. Yep. So how's he going to do it? Look at this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He's going to do it with living stones. Praise God. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envies, all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious. Yeah. You also, as lively, that word translates living, as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So not only was Jesus the temple and everything that's in the temple, amen, and the sacrifice and the, and the priest, we have the sacrifice, we are the temple, we offer sacrifices of praise. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Yeah. Amen. 
We are a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are the living stone. We are the temple. The temple just continues to grow. It was never supposed to be a building someplace. It was a type to show us what our position and our, our, our calling really is in Christ. Remember, it's Christ the first fruits. Whatever he was, we're supposed to continue that. And we're camped out trying to build another building somewhere. I'm not against buildings because you've got to have some place to come together. I'm just saying, you know, we've made it about institutions when he's the institution. We've made it about events and he's all the events. People want to celebrate this, the Passover and this thing and that thing. It's fine. If you, understand, if you just celebrate the Lord, you don't have to set aside one holiday a year or one feast day or whatever it is and make that the big deal. That thing was just talking about Jesus. It wasn't the, yeah. the Passover. He is the Passover. Yes. He is the Feast of Tabernacles. Yes. Hallelujah. He's, he's all in all. Amen. So, living stones. God's people extend the temple into this new creation. Amen? The temple has been transformed into God and his people, which is what it was intended to be, what it was supposed to be all along. So what's the point, Nathan? Well, look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And I, I'm not going to touch on everything because if I did, we'd be here for three days, but just get this in here. And in your mind, so that when you go back and read, you meditate this way, and you begin to see yourself in a whole other light. You begin to see God in a whole other light. You begin to see the world in a whole different way. So from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion. Forever and ever. Amen? So the power of our witness grows from the power of God's word. Amen. You, 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 I People all the time, I got this healing anointing. I, got, I don't care what you got. Whatever you got, come from Jesus. That's right. And everybody has access to the same anointing. He is the anointed. And that's what irritates me and irks me sometimes about Christian television is because it's all, it always ends up being about somebody outside of Christ. And how can the temple fill the earth if we only got a half a dozen temples, amen, on. one here, one over here somewhere, and another back here somewhere? No, it's got to be all of us operating, amen, as kings and priests with authority, amen, and spiritual power. And until we get that revelation... We're just playing the same. We might as well be back under the covenant of the law. Praise God. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth. This is another way of saying king of kings. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings. And priest unto God and his Father. That's not just cliche. That's not just uh, some metaphorical way of talking. This is the reality. This is what he's trying to get us to understand. And be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. So the power of our witness grows from the power of God's word. And if we don't understand God's word, I don't care how much we confess. I don't care how much we pray. I don't care how much we do. If you want to know the truth... Anytime you've had a miracle, an encounter with the reality of God, it's been because you got a revelation of something, even if it was only that much of it. It was enough to cause you to step out and do something that you wouldn't have otherwise done. Amen. That's what we're talking about here. We need to be walking in the fullness of this in order to operate in the fullness of it. We need to know what God's word is really saying to us, not what some denomination has taught us, not what our, you know, somebody else's interpretation of it is. But what God is really saying in his word. Because the moment we begin to really operate in that reality, everything becomes fulfilled. Everything starts flowing the way it was supposed to flow. Praise the Lord. Adam's failure as a priest 
in the sanctuary garden. And he even talks about, I, I quoted those scriptures to you last week, where it talks about Satan in the sanctuaries of God. That's what the garden was. It was, it was the first temple. First place for God and man to be able to, to meet. For God to be able to speak to man. For man to be able to approach God. Amen. So, the failure of Adam was the failure as a priest who, who, who failed in the sanctuary of the garden. And it grew of his failure to believe and to keep God's word. Satan's working the same way today that he always has. Adam failed because he didn't, and Eve failed because they didn't really believe what God said. And when Satan came along and gave them a twisted version of him, which is exactly what he tried to do to Jesus in the wilderness, he tried to twist the word of God or, or, or manipulate it in a way so that it would sound different than what God had actually said. Exactly. So they couldn't get the result that God wanted for them. He does the same thing all the time. Sadly, he uses religion to do it a lot of times. So Adam and Eve did not remember God's word, and they failed as a result of that. All right, let's go back to 1 Peter again, Sheila. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. First Peter 2 and 9. But you, that would be you, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You say, okay, I get the peculiar, but the rest of this just isn't lining up with my reality. Well, stay with me because th there's, that's the reason that God does things the way he does. And that's why prophetic words are, are contextual and they expand your understanding. Because even though we know that this is the word of God, a lot of us struggle with this reality. Okay. A chosen generation, royal priest, and holy nation with all of my flaws? Yeah, I'm born again, but I still got issues, you know? Holy nation, peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes. So if God's presence, if, if his dwelling place is going to fill the earth, we have to be priests in the temple. Yes, Lord. You and I. It won't happen any other way. This is his plan. This is the way that he's got it set up. It can't happen just if we get more religion, build more church buildings, you know, get more people to come to church or do this or do that. No, we have to become priests and, and the temple in which we minister. Because it won't work any other way because God prefigured it this way. That's right. That's right. Come on now. Let me show you something. The building of the tabernacle, it raised a lot of hope for Israel. Amen? In spite of Adam's failure, Israel gets a chance to be obedient. Right? To do what the word says. But the sin of the golden calf during that same time period was just the beginning of idolatry. Just the beginning of them not believing what God said. However, Jesus, the last Adam, who never failed, and by the way, the true Israel, you say amen or oh man, but that's the, that's the reality, yep. is faithful where the first Adam and the first Israel were faithless. Uh -huh. Praise God. If Jesus, the word made flesh, go to John 1, 14 to prove this. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt translates, literal translation is tabernacle. So the word tabernacle, and we beheld the glory. We saw it. We saw what Isaiah saw in the temple. That's what he was prophesying. Come on. He didn't literally see it. He had a prophetic vision of this. The word was made flesh and it tabernacle among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Praise the Lord. So the tabernacle of God's presence, the temple, right? Now, if Jesus, this right here, 
only said what his father said, then it's only reasonable that we would follow him by doing the same thing. Instead of telling everybody how bad this thing is, we should be declaring healing. Now, I'm not being critical. I'm not being hateful. I'm just saying, come. if we don't change, we're stuck with the same results we've had all along. Somewhere along, somebody's got to recognize, hey, I am a priest. I am in a temple. And it's my responsibility, my obligation as a priest called of God before the foundation of the world to start declaring Amen. What God has done. Yes, Lord. God said, by my stripes, you're healed. Somebody comes to me, I'm supposed to say, you're healed. Not, oh, tell me what the doctor said and how many times you have been through this and what your, you know, genetic background is and all that kind of stuff. No. That's, my job is not to hear all of that. My job is to declare you healed because God sent you here healed. God sent you to the temple and to the priest to declare your healing. Amen. It's no different. I'm going to, I'm, again, I'm going to read this in just a minute. But it's no different than Jesus. He healed them and he said, now go to the temple and show yourself to the priest. God said the same thing. Yeah. By his stripes you were healed. Now it's up to you. I'm sending sick people. I'm even sending you sometimes to the temple. And I'll go by what the priest says. But the priest is supposed to go by what I did. Uh, and we're going by intellect. We're going by what we know and what we feel instead of what God said. Yes, Lord. And we get the results Adam got instead of the results Jesus got. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. All right, let's look at that. Luke chapter 17, verses 12 through 14. Now, it sounds uncompassionate or incompassionate or insensitive. Jesus had compassion on all of them, but he didn't play games with them. What do you want me to do? Heal me. You're healed. You can believe it or you can continue suffering with your condition. Praise the Lord. But he preached the kingdom everywhere he went. Building faith up in people so that then when he offered healing, they had faith for healing. Well, you can't do that if we're preaching everything other than the kingdom of God and then expect people to have faith in healing. Even if they believe that God wants them healed. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we're not preaching the reality of the kingdom of God, this thing that we're talking about here, then why would we expect people's faith to grow up to a place where they would expect to get it? It happens only sporadically and inconsistently when revelation comes to somebody and they step out in faith on that revelation. Yeah. Then we get it. Why doesn't it happen all the time? Because we're not operating in revelation all the time. Most of the time we're operating in religion and fear and hope and all these other things. If you get revelation, yeah. nothing can stop you. Jesus operated as a man. Not as the Son of God, as the Son of Man. That's right. But he had a complete revelation of God and the Word of God, and that's why he had such power. He didn't deviate from it. He said what his Father said. He believed what his Father said. He did what he saw his Father do. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It would be better for him that a millstone were hanging about his neck and cast into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if, you, if not, repent and forgive him. Praise the Lord. I, I need you to drop right down to chapter or verse 12, Sheila. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. 12 through what? 12 through 14. This is all good, but it's just not where we need to be. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. This is, this is the perfect example. This is a type. This is a shadow. This is a, uh, a, 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 a prophetic look at what's to come. Remember, this is still under the law, but Jesus is establishing a new kingdom. He's preaching a new kingdom to come. The kingdom of God is near you, and it will be in you. So he's showing us how it works. So he sees these guys, lepers, which stood far off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were healed. They were cleansed. He didn't say, you're healed. He said, go show yourself to the priest. The priest, under the law, it was the priest's responsibility to declare a leper cleansed or, un or, or unclean. Now, the priest had to either believe what Jesus did, amen, or in the case of us, we have to believe what God has already done. We are a priest. We are a temple. And I was personal. You just say, thank you, Jesus. By your stripes, I was healed. Amen. I'm healed in Jesus' name. I'm declaring what he said. Am I not? Amen. So when somebody else who is not necessarily a believer or doesn't believe exactly like we do comes to me and says, you know, I got this thing, I got that thing, and I'll say, okay, here's what God said. So I only have one response to that, and that's your healing. You've been cleansed. Are you with me? Yep. Now, whether they get it or not is a whole other issue, but as believers, that's all we're supposed to be doing. Right. We're not supposed to get into the debates. We're not supposed to get into the pity parties. And I don't mean to say we can't be sensitive to other people's feelings and, 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 and their pain, but I'm saying sympathy will not feed the admiral's cat, praise the Lord. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You've got to do something, and you've got to do it in agreement with what God says, or you're just not going to get results. They'll feel better all the way to the morgue. I mean, they'll feel better about themselves if somebody cares. But I got somebody calls me at least three times a day. And I give them over and over. And this isn't necessarily a physical thing, but it's still a, might as well be physical because it's, it manifests itself that way. And all they really want is to whine. And I'll be, I can be sympathetic, but I have a limit at some point. If you're not going to do what I say, if you're not going to, why, why do you keep calling and asking me? Right. Right? I mean, if you, if, if you just, if all you want is another opinion, call anybody. Right. But if you want to know what I believe, and then I tell you what I believe, don't call me back tomorrow and go through the same thing all over. Well, you don't understand because I had this really bad childhood. Everybody had a bad childhood. <laughs> Believe me, everybody had something in their childhood they regret or they wish was different or they had a better this or a different that or whatever. But how long are you going to live? And I, last time I just said, hey, listen, I'm sorry. I don't want to be cruel, but all you're giving me is excuses. Yeah. You're not giving me reasons. Come on. You're giving me excuses. Come on. And I'll pray with you, and I did pray again. But I said, look, until you get past you, God's not going to do anything for you. He can't. Because you've become bigger than God. You're telling me God won't do this. God didn't do that. God caused this. God caused that. I, I, I'm just saying, we, we have just distorted this message to the point where I'm telling you, it is nothing but the grace of God that we get healed at all. That we see the, 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 the manifest presence of God. It's just because of his grace and because of his love. He wants his glory to fill the earth. Yes. Fill the temple, fill the earth. The temple just keeps going and going. Amen? Amen? So he sends them off, and that was, they were healed. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. So our ongoing task is to serve God as priests in his temple. That's, that's how simple it is. Whose temple, by the way, you are. Right? right? And guess what else? It's where you always reside. Remember he said, the they're, at, they're at this all, day, all the time. Continuously ministering. You, look, you dwell in your temple. Yep. You have the capacity to minister there anytime, all the time. Yep. Praise the Lord. You're healed. In Jesus' name. How do I know because he healed you. Yes. Well, how can you be so dogmatic? That's not being dogmatic. That's being honest. That's being realistic. That's what he said. Either we believe what he said, or we better get out of the priesthood. Uh, Turn in your robe. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Find a different job. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Once again, Revelation chapter 5 
and verse 8. I had a couple more things to show you because I know we're, we, you know, we struggle with this because of our humanity. But that's why God gave us grace and delivered us and told us, I will not impute sin to you anymore. I don't want you to have a consciousness of sin. Come on. You're my priest. Come on. You function in the temple. Holy, holy, holy. Everything's holy there. You've got to feel that. You've got to believe that or you will not operate as the priest that God called you to be. When he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Mike can tell you a little about uh, harp and, and uh, bowl. But I, the significance here is, here they were, the, 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 the lamb of God, and before him the twenty elders and the four beasts, and one of them harp golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Amen? All right, chapter 8 now, still in Revelation, chapter 8, verses 3 to 5. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with, the, with fire up, off the altar and cast it under the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. That sounds like a move of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, here's what I'm saying. I'm gonna go, I want you to go back to 1 Chronicles, uh, Sheila, chapter 6, verse 49, to get the original picture of what this is really about. So, 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 49. But recognize, Old Testament prayer and New Testament prayer are different. Right. Old Testament prayer, you're praying that you've been good enough or that your sacrifice was, would be acceptable so that God would then move in your life. Mm -hmm. New Testament prayers are operating from the victory of Jesus Christ. Yes. The sacrifice has already been accepted once yes. and for all. So now when we pray, we're not praying... Uh, please give me, give me, give me. We're praying in the name of Jesus, according to your word, God, yes. by your stripes, they're healed. Yes. Amen. That's how we pray. We're not praying, please, oh God, please. You never. No, we are declaring the truth. That's the prayer that goes up. And that's why it's a sweet savor to God, because it's faith. Yes. And God always honors faith. Yes, yes. Faith. Without faith, you can't please God, which by definition then would tell you faith pleases God. Makes him feel good about us and his relationship. So here, here's the original. This is the, the type or the, the shadow. Aaron and his sons offered upon the altar of the burnt offering and on the altar of incense and were appointed for all the work of the place most holy and to make an atonement for Israel according to all that Moses, the servant of God, had commanded. Praise the Lord. Our prayers fulfill the Old Testament prophecy. The Old Testament type is fulfilled in what we're doing today, what we're supposed to be doing today. If we want to go back to First Chronicles and pray the kind of prayers that were being prayed back there, then we're, 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 we can't expect results. Right. Because unless we have the sacrifice of Jesus, there is no sacrifice. Either you operate from that sacrifice or you have no sacrifice. That's what we read earlier. Outside of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the offering of his blood, there is no sacrifice. So no matter how much begging and pleading and self-sacrificing uh, you do, it's not going to get you anything. And actually, it, it's a slap in the face to God. Praise the Lord. So our prayers are fulfilling what those priests were doing there right. to a much greater level yeah. to the spiritual reality that God was trying to show through this. Alright, Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11. Malachi 1 and 11. For from the rising of the sun even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. How many know 
Malachi was a prophet. In fact, he was the last prophet. God shut their mouth for 400 years until the great prophet John the Baptist come, and then the greatest prophet, Jesus himself, yes, showed yes. up. So, rising, the rising of the sun, even under the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. That had to kind of be a burr in the saddle of the, the Jews who just didn't want anything to do with him. But he said, my name's going to be great among the Gentiles in every place. Incense shall be offered. <laughs> Prayer. That's what he's talking about. Right. Every place. All over the world. Uh -huh. Incense will be offered unto my name. And a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. A pure offering? Prayer of faith. Everywhere. So it's going to be every place. Why? Because the temple is going to be everywhere. It won't just be a couple of three guys doing it over here. It'll be everywhere. The temple is being built up. These live, living stones. There's going to be sacrifices of praise mm -hmm. and worship yes. and prayer offerings going, for, going up before the Lord. Everywhere, he said. Yes. So if we know that we are the temple of God, we are kings and priests, then we're going to minister the word. Not our opinion, not somebody else's opinion, but what the Word of God says. Not even your experience, because some of us have had some experiences that don't agree with the Word of God. That just means I got a screwed up experience. Amen. Doesn't make, doesn't change the Word of God. It's it's settled. Praise the Lord. If we do that. The result is, and you don't have to go there for the sake of time, Sheila, but in Romans 5, he talks about we will reign, grace. Because of grace, we will reign and rule in this life. We will reign as kings and rule as priests. Praise God. So Jesus is a temple. We are temples. Jesus is the king of kings. We're kings. Go back to what I was saying a little earlier that we go, yeah, well, that's easily said, but you don't really know what's going on in me. You don't know what's going on in my life. You don't need, you don't know the, the kind of uh, short coming there is in my life compared to a king or a priest. But I just can't see myself measuring up. Well, David was a king of Israel. And that wasn't a title that he could maintain with clean hands or a pure heart because he was a liar, he was an adulterer, he was a murderer. Amen? Yeah. He had unclean hands. He had an impure heart. Look at Psalms chapter 24 and verses 1 through 6. And yet God had anointed him king and never took the kingdom away from him. It was passed on to the next generation. Lord. In spite of his impure heart and his unclean hands. So David writes this psalm and he says, believe me, David knew. David had the same issues that we had. God's anointed us as kings. He's declared us priests. But Lord, how can I come before you? How can I, with my unclean hands and my impure heart, how can I expect you? To honor this. And David wrote this psalm. He said, The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? That's just another word for the temple. The temple mount, the mountain of the Lord, hill of the Lord. Or who shall stand in his holy place, in the holy of holies, in the presence of God? Who's going to be able to do that? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Somebody who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. Now David just disqualified himself. He said, who is going to happen for is the one who receives the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That is beautiful. Because yeah. he disqualifies himself and then he says, but if you can receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation, you are made the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ, right? Because of his mercy, because of his grace. This is the generation of them that seek him, 
that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. This is what godly humanity looks like. This is David, corrupted, afflicted, persecuted. Who will go to the place where God is? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. But what David is saying here is that the one who receives God's favor is the one who's perfect. Because look at this. Oh, great, you say. Oh, great, but you don't know my stuff. I can't be a temple. I can't be the priest declaring healing and holiness and offering up powerful prayers. Or be a king with authority. But instead of saying, oh, great, how about saying, thank God. Amen. Who can stand where God is? This is how David follows up his, this intimidating declaration that only someone perfectly holy can enter God's presence. Psalms 24, verse 7 through 10 now. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up. The everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. And Selah means more than amen. It is a prayerful sigh of relief. He declares this, and then he goes, Whew. Who can ascend God's holy mountain? Who can abide in his presence? Only the blameless, only the holy, only the perfect. So here's God's word to you this morning. Look up. Lift up your chin. Draw near to the throne of grace and mercy and do it with confidence. Here comes the king of glory bringing grace into our presence and making us perfect so that we can minister before God on the behalf of others and including ourselves. See, I said all that just to say that Jesus has intruded into the world. And he's tearing down the veil of separation so that we can enter into the presence of God and minister before him as only the high priest could under the old covenant. By the sprinkling of blood from the sacrifice on the day of atonement, we have a perfect sacrifice but we have no more concern. We have been sprinkled with that blood and purified so that we can walk right into the presence of God and minister to God through our prayers, through our faith, and through our declarations of what he has said tear down the veil of separation. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you can do all things through Christ, through strength. Yep. You are a temple, you are a priest, and you're a king. Lift up your heads. The king of glory has come for you. Take a deep breath. Whew. Those are your 3D glasses. <laughs> and as the writer of the song once said, If you'll look at the word of God from these revelations, from this truth, from the purpose that God intended, nothing shall be impossible for you. You will be able to do exactly what Jesus did because you'll be functioning in the role, the position, and the reality that God has declared you to be in. Praise the Lord. What has been a struggle should just be your uh, career choice. Amen. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you again. Happy Independence Day. Have a great time. Stay safe. Enjoy the holiday. Show yourself. I said the other day, temple up. Oh, king up, man. I mean, come on. He's king you. Enjoy it. Live it to the fullest in Jesus' name. You're dismissed. God bless you all.